Now we hear from Annalise Andrade on her experience with the Troubling the Waters group. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Good, great. First, I wanna start by thanking Shannon and David for leading us through this really transformative journey. I'm so grateful to my wife, Cara, who signed me up for this group or voluntold me. <laughs> and uh, for this remarkable group of white Christians who created a safe space uh, for me to learn and who have each taught me so much. And of course, I wanna thank Pastor Sarah for her insight and wisdom in knowing that this is the work of our time and her constant reminders of the infinite capacity of God's grace to help us heal even from racism. Second, I would like to apologize. Um, I'll be talking about things that may make you feel uncomfortable, might even offend you, but that is not my intent. Um, but I suspect it is the intent of this curriculum to help us work through some of our discomfort um, around racism. So to start off, in, in the mid 1980s or in the 1980s, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America made a commitment to become an intentionally anti-racist church. Their words, not mine. Here I am in 2020 reading Ibram Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist thinking I am woke uh, when my church committed to this ideology 40 years ago. I love my church for many reasons and this is one of the many reasons. So let me start just by focusing on the name troubling the waters. To me, the word trouble makes me think of pain and suffering. I spent my childhood in Catholic school trying my darndest to stay out of trouble because I knew that would lead to some pain and suffering. Um, I currently spend my adult life as a doctor trying to heal pain and suffering. And for goodness sakes, I go to a church called Peace. I am definitely not looking for trouble. So let me try to explain. The name of the group is Troubling the Waters for Healing of the Church an invitation for white Christians to journey from privilege to partnership. The name is taken from an African-American spiritual hymn written in the mid 1800s, Wade in the Water, God's Gonna Trouble the Water. The chorus of the hymn is from the New Testament, John chapter five, an angel came down and troubled the waters and the first one to enter the troubled waters will be healed. The verses of the hymn reference the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, the story of the Israelites escaped from Egypt, Moses leading his people to freedom. It's no surprise that this was one of the many songs associated with the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman would use songs giving coded instructions to enslaved people who were trying to escape. If you come down to the water, if you wade in the water, the bloodhounds can't smell you. My take home message just from the name alone is the path to freedom, freedom from pain and suffering inflicted by racism is a journey through our troubled racist history. And God knows we have a lot of healing to do. So you know what that means. There's gonna be a lot of trouble. So the curriculum was broken down into 18 sessions that followed the seasons of the church. We started in the season of Advent in December we entered the water as a group and stood at the baptismal font and we asked for your blessings. In the season of Christmas and Epiphany, we were experiencing our own epiphanies as we investigated our unique cultural history. As we told these stories of our pasts, it became clear that the events that we were currently living through were going to change the course of our history. We were in the middle of a presidential impeachment. There was escalating climate crisis Australia was being devastated by wildfires, and I began to have a strange burning sensation in my own chest. On February 23rd, we learned of the murder of Ahmad Aubrey in Georgia. He was shot by a former police officer. The apparent crime? He was jogging while being black. Later, the video of his murder actually showed us he was not jogging. He was running for his life as he was hunted down in a pickup truck. Then began the season of Lent. Our group was searching for the truth. We studied the history of our church, our government, our dominant white culture, the hard painful truth of our history of enslaving people and the genocide of indigenous people. We toured the African American Museum and saw the drawings of slave ships with human bodies stacked in like books on a shelf. 
We read the manifestos learning that half their cargo didn't make it to their destination alive. We touched the cold slave blocks where infants were ripped from their mother's breasts as they were auctioned to different owners. And then there were the pictures, the pictures, the pictures of lynching. These were not strange fruit hanging from Southern trees as lamented in the Billie Holiday song. These were children like 14 year old Emmett Till. These were not just pictures of black boys like Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith hanging from trees just 19 years old, but there were pictures showing the lynch mobs, crowds of white men and women, just like me, smiling and laughing. To paint a more complete picture, the experience at the, uh, the African American Museum was wonderful and uplifting. There were amazing pictures and videos of the civil rights movement of white people sitting next to black people at Woolworth counters and white people walking hand in hand with black people over bridges and videos and speeches about dreams and justice. But at this point, I could clearly identify that feeling in my chest was, it wasn't heartburn, it was anger. And as the COVID pandemic brought life as we know it to a halt, I was trapped in my house with this anger. And then on March 13th, we learned about Breonna Taylor, who was murdered by police officers in her bed. The apparent crime, having poor judgment. They were looking for her ex-boyfriend. We now know the police already had him in custody at the time they broke down her door and murdered her. I am now feeling rage but it's the season of Easter now, time, new life, Jesus is risen. Our group was trying to heal from the disease of racism while hiding in our homes from the disease of coronavirus. We were in quarantine, we were honoring frontline heroes, we were all in this together. By Easter Sunday, we had lost 20,000 lives in this country. The death rate was more than 2,000 a day, most in New York at the time, and most were black and brown lives. The social disparities in our healthcare system are now becoming painfully clear to all to see, but I had a front row seat. I was no longer feeling rage, I was feeling outrage. But on May 25th, we learned about the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis police officer, by four Minneapolis police officers. We watched for over eight minutes as he pleaded with those police officers saying more than a dozen times he could not breathe. The apparent crime using a counterfeit $20 bill to buy groceries. We listened as he pleaded for his mama and we watched him take his last breaths. And then we watched for an additional three minutes before the officers finally stopped kneeling on his neck. I no longer had words for how I was feeling. Then came the season of Pentecost. We, had, we hadn't left our houses in months. It was time for action. We were protesting with thousands of people. It was as if someone had lit a flame under our collective rare ends. I have come to believe it was the Holy Spirit troubling the waters so we can all be healed from this disease of racism. Millions of people around the world are troubling the waters. They're chanting Black Lives Matter. They're calling to defund the police, make reparations, demand change in our healthcare systems, our school systems, our housing systems, all of which have institutionalized racism, racist ideologies and policies. I am not here to condemn or condone any of those actions. I'm here to share with you my personal journey, my church, my God asked me to explore the racism within me. I began this journey by saying I am not a racist. Over these months, I've tried to honestly understand the power, the privilege, the prejudice that belongs to me personally. I am now much more aware of how I personally have benefited from our dominant white culture and how institutions created by white supremacists better benefit me at the expense of people of color. I no longer deny the disease of racism is within me just as someone afflicted with the disease of alcoholism has to acknowledge they are an alcoholic before they can be healed. To be an anti-racist, I have to understand how I have been a racist, how racism is integrated in all the systems that I benefit from, and only then can I help dismantle them. Troubling the waters was just the first step along what I hope to be a lifetime journey of continued learning. And once you understand, then doing nothing is no longer an option. Thank you.